morning guys dr jillard here once again let's do some spinal anatomy finally done with the lumbar spine we're starting on the thoracic spine it is tuesday it is week six and this is the first of three lectures thoracic vertebra let's we'll start with that we're very familiar with these parts already spinous process well let's just go through and there's the list. Uh, there's a couple differences I'll point out before I move over. So <clears> the <throat> weird thing about thoracic vertebrae, most of them anyway, there's no superior vertebral notch. That's crazy. All right? <clears throat> That's definitely crazy. We'll see the... And there's costal facets. Right? We don't have costal facets. You haven't even probably heard of that word before. That's where the ribs articulate to the vertebral body and transverse processes. So that's weird. Let's look at this. I think this is on your lab sheet, actually. So this is a typical, how can you tell this is a typical mid-thoracic vertebrae? Look at the spinous process, right? The ones we've looked at so far in the lumbar spine are coming straight out, <clears throat> straight in the horizontal plane. This one's... I mean, they're not quite vertical. This is vertical, right? This is horizontal. <clears throat> it's you know, about 45 degrees from, uh, from horizontal. So that's definitely a strange type of thing. <clears throat> Let's go through the parts. So we have a superior articular process like before. We have an inferior articular process. We'll look at the joints later on that. We still have a pedicle, right? Here's the pedicle region. We still have a nice big inferior vertebral notch. Okay, in fact, the, the neuroforamen are the biggest in the whole spine. They're huge. The ratio of spinal nerve to inner vertebral foramen, it's a huge ratio. Vertebral body's the same, bony end plate, superior bony vertebral end plate, inferior bony end plate there. Uh, I can't see the lamina in this view, <clears throat> but there's no, where's the arch? There's no, there's no superior vertebral notch. It's just a straight kind of line. And now we got some weird things. So a typical vertebrae, we have two facets. Specifically, they're demi facets. Okay, there's a demi facet here and a demi facet here. What does demi mean? What does demi mean? Demi. It means one half. So these are not full facets. They're kind of kind of half facets, if you will. All right. And what else do we need to say? That's about all we can see from that view. We go from an overhead view. You can see the pedicles quite nicely here. All right. <clears throat> here is the ring apothesis. Remember we talked about? That's the secondary growth centers occur there. That's where your height where a kid grows in height. And the other weird thing, look at the transverse processes. Right? Normally transverse processes stick straight out like this. These are swept back. So that's another way you can tell this is a thoracic vertebrae. And some at some levels down at T11, T12, they're just little stubs. So that's another thing that's weird. All right, what else can we see from this view? We could see the superior articular processes. You can see the lamina. Be right here. Let's write something down here a second. Okay, I think we got everything. The vertebral foramen is more round than other levels. It's a really a round hole. So that's also a little weird. But we'll see all the weirdness as we keep going through this. General differences, the spi as we everything I said, spinous processes are more vertical compared to, especially in the mid-thoracic spine. Now the upper thoracic spine, they started to become more horizontal. Same with the lower thoracic spine, but <clears throat> the mid-thoracic spine 
T6, T7, T8. Those things are really, really vertical. Now there's no mammillary processes anymore or accessory processes for per se. T12 does have a weird setup. It does have some rudimentary mammillary and accessory processes that come off the side. But for the rest, in fact, the mammillary process is pretty safe to say they're only in the lumbar spine normally. There's no uncovertebral joints, although sometimes T1 can have uncovertebral joint. Um, there are costal facets, as we said, for articulation with the ribs. Not true of anywhere else. Sometimes C7 has one, but usually not. Sometimes L1 has maybe a demi facet, but usually not. And again, there's no superior, superior vertebral notches. Typical versus atypical. <clears throat> the normal run-of-the-mill vertebrae, T2 through T8. Those are typical. There are some oddballs. Wait till we get to the cervical spine. We'll talk about some really crazy vertebrae, C1 and C2. Uh, but T1, T9 sometimes, it's hit or miss. But we'll say for our testing purposes, um, we'll say T1, T9, T10, T11, T12. This is... T9 is kind of a weird one uh, because more, Moore's anatomy, that is a board book. That's I don't use that book. Uh, I know some of the, uh, I think the uh, teachers use it at our school. I don't really care for it. I like the two grays, stand ring, the big, uh, thick, really thick one, very evidence-based. And then the student grays has been around forever. Those are my favorite by far. But nevertheless, I always check all the board books, and Moore's adds T9 in there. So that's a board book. Kramer does not include T9. Um, so I don't really know what to do. I'll probably stay away from that, uh, that question. How about that? Okay, another thing interesting about the typical thoracic vertebrae, if you look from underneath uh, I to S view or a S to I view, they are heart shaped. We'll see a real one here in a minute. So the other vertebrae aren't heart shaped like that. Uh, so that's weird. Also, the typical thoracic vertebrae, the transverse width, when you look from um, an S to I view, the transverse width of the vertebral body is greater than the sagittal width. Right. In other words, this width here, I guess the lateral width is greater than the A to P width. Hence, you get kind of a heart shape. Here's a vertebrae. So this is T10. I could have, I should have probably picked a T7 uh, because sh short little stubby processes, the lower you go, or transverse processes. But nevertheless, that's pretty heart shaped looking, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, you can see the pedicles here quite nicely. Uh, transverse processes. Anybody see anything weird here? Transverse processes, lamina, lamina, spinous process. Transverse processes are uh, kind of weird how they come off the pedicles. Uh, so that's here. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover that more in a minute, but that's definitely another weird type thing. Typical thoracic vertebrae is also, there's two wedges. Put, probably should have put a star on that slide. That's a good test question. Uh, there are two wedges. If you look from a lateral view on this one, by the way, that's nice, isn't it? What's that? Those are the demi facets. That's a pretty big demi facet, but nevertheless, there's an inferior uh, demi facet, superior demi facet, and there's the transverse costal facet. So inferior or superior costal demi facet, inferior costal demi facet transverse uh, costal facet, transverse costal facet. I'm digressing. Diameter from here. See how it goes wedge. Guess what that does? 
put another wedge on top of that, what's how's the curve going to look? The vertebra body. I'll exaggerate it. See how it's creating a a kyphotic curve. Okay. Uh, there's also some posterior anterior wedging uh, that occurs uh, from a, a PA view. Uh, oh, we just said that. Um, let's see. From a lateral view, PA wedging. Yeah, we said that already. Got that one covered. What about a lateral wedging from an A to P or a coronal type view? So I don't think I have a picture. I, didn't, I forgot to take one. Um, but if you're looking straight at a at a PDA view, uh, so there's a left lateral wedging because there's a greater superior to inferior measure on the left. So this would be the left if we're looking head at head on at the vertebrae. That's the left over here. I'll exaggerate it. So. There tends to be a slight wedge to that way. And therefore, you can start to get a little bit of a scoliosis with apex left because of that. And that's not really enough to be a scoliosis. It's more asymmetry means the Cobb's angle is under 10 degrees. So it's more like that. Uh, but that's So that's normal. So it's abnormal to have a perfectly straight thoracic spine. Should be a tiny asymmetry there. Pedicles are weird, so unlike the cervical vertebrae, they're made mainly of cancellous bone. We didn't really get into that too much, uh, but they have only a very thin shell of cortex. Remember bone, if we look at a pedicle head-on, it has a thicker, stronger outer region, which is the cortex, made of real, comp or made of real compact, tough bone. And the inside, we have more of a turbeculae type system. I think you learned this in histology, I'm sure. Uh, but that's called the cancellous bone. So it's not that strong here. What Anybody know why that would be? Well, we got ribs coming in, right? We got ribs giving it extra strength. So uh, thoracic spine, lot, it's a rare place to really have serious injury uh, because it's so supported with ribs. Uh, the inner vertebral foramen are huge there. And we'll look at that here in a bit or maybe tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> okay, we, we already said there's no superior vertebral body. Uh, the pedicles are also uh, attached very high in the posterior lateral vertebral body. So they're not like if this is a side view here. Most vertebrae have pedicles like that, right? That gives us a little room to have a superior vertebral or a superior vertebral notch here. Uh, but on thoracic vertebrae, pedicles come right off like this. So that's weird. That, that's why you don't have a superior vertebral notch there. Okay, T1 is a little different. T1 does have a little bit of a superior vertebral notch. That's kind of an oddball. Um, but for the rest of them, there's no superior vertebral notch. And because the pedicle is attached up high, the inferior vertebral notch is huge. So the inferior vertebral notch is quite exaggerated in thoracic spine, typical thoracic spine vertebrae. Right? And here's this picture again. I mean, where's the, the pedicle comes right off the bony implant here, superior bony implant, morphs right into the pedicle, which morphs right into the superior articular process. There's no notch. And the whole pedicle is attached up high, and we have this huge inferior vertebral notch because of this. Pretty good. Transverse processes we kind of set already. They're kind of swept back like a like a jet from an overhead view. Uh, they project obliquely posteriorly is the official way to say that. In other words, they sweep back. Uh, medial to lateral, specifically the direction is medial to lateral, anterior to posterior 
is how they sweep back. Uh, and they don't stick out just laterally like the lumbar do. I mean, the cervical actually stick out a little more, uh, a little more posterior to hand here. Uh, they sweep forward a little bit. All right, uh, they arise behind the pedicles and the inner vertebral foramen and articular processes. So they're said to lie more in the posterior plane uh, than, in, than compared to the lumbar cervical. Unlike transverse processes, most contain transverse costal facets. Okay, we don't have those on any other vertebrae, but not all of them. There are, that's a good question, which ones don't contain, typically contain costal transverse facets. T11 and T12 never have a transverse costal facet. T10 may or may not. It all depends how that T11 is designed, how the, the head of the rib is designed. All right, just showing you that the transverse processes arise posterior to the pedicle. The pedicle's right here. Just to show you, here's what the lumbar vertebrae look like. They're pretty much sticking straight out, maybe a tiny bit of sweep back. But the cervical, we'll talk about cervicals are weird. We have a double strutted transverse process on the cervicals. So that's weird. And they stick out, actually. They sweep forward instead of sweep back. What does that mean, sweep back? I mean, if this, if this was a car, put some wheels on it, or what are those little three-wheeled things called? And this is the way it would drive. You could sit on it right here. There's your head, and there's your nose, shoulders. Your legs can hang over the front. This is why I don't draw. Um, but yeah, if it was a vehicle, it would drive this way. And therefore, the wind would sweep these back like this. And this would be swept forward. Okay, because if this car was driving forward, the wind wouldn't push. These would actually be into the wind. That's where that sweep comes from anyway. Ooh, look at that. Is that a cervical, lumbar, or thoracic vertebrae? Got to be a thoracic vertebrae because the transverse processes are swept back. At least one of the typical uh, thoracic vertebrae, right? It's got to be a thoracic vertebrae because the wings are swept back. TPs are swept back. And we got that that kind of harp, heart-shaped vertebral body, right? It's another way. And the transverse processes come off after the pedicles. Pedicles are done, and then they come off, and they include the articular pillars. Those are all, if I put that on the lab final, identify this bone, that would be fun, wouldn't it? To make sure you know that kind of stuff. Uh, the facets of the superior articular uh, processes f face backwards. So if I could draw the facet here, it would be right here. right? So that's going to articulate with the inferior articular processes, the facet of the one below. So I could, if I could draw it in here like that, it would come something like that, right? And then the spinous would go back like that. Uh, but that would be the inferior articular process. So the inferior articular process would have the facet facing forward. It would be on the other side. We can't quite see it, but I can draw it in. The superior articular process has the facet facing backwards. The inferior has the, fa the facet facing forwards or anteriorly. And if you want to get technical, the superior articular processes, uh, they face posteriorly. And they have a little bit of superior and lateral tilt to them as well. The inferior articular processes face anterior, but they have a little bit of anterior and medial tilt to them. They have, has to, these have to be opposites, right? Because these two are meeting together. That's why these have to be the opposite ways. Okay, another high yield question, so make sure you know that. Okay, uh, thoracic motion segment, because of the facet orientation, they're very sagittal, really, right? You can have a lot of rotation occur here. However, flexion and extension is going to be quite limited. 
you can't bend when the, the, the facets are so, so sagittal. Right? Another weird thing, it's not unusual for the right facet. There's a lot of facet tropism. We talked about that, right, in the lumbar spine. But there's a lot of facet tropism that goes on here. So it's not unusual for one to be coronal and the other one to be more sagittal, more so than any other region of the spine. Why isn't the thoracic spine usually a big, serious deal? Uh, another reason is they... Uh, not, they're not as pain sensitive as the other Z joints are. Uh, so they research shows there's not a lot of uh, nociceptors in there to, to even send the signal of pain. The synovial folds, we didn't talk about this on lumbar. Got to remember to put that in next time. But the facet joint has synovial folds. All diarthroidal joints have synovial folds. Uh, and they secrete synovial fluid which is made of what? Glycosaminoglycans. It's a slippery type of stuff. And proteoglycans. Uh, but the folds in the lumbar spine overgrow, and they can actually be pinched. They can kind of get sucked into the facet joint and be pinched. In the thoracic spine, the research shows that the synovial folds are much shorter, uh, and they don't tend to be entrapped like that and cause a facet joint syndrome or a facet to lock up like that. So it's another two things that are they're not as pain sensitive. The vertebral canal, as we said, is much rounder in shape. It is smaller compared to the cervical or thoracic cord as well. The neuroforamen are actually bigger, but the, the central canal here, or the vertebral canal, is smaller. So that's that. What, look at this thoracic vertebrae for a second. That's pretty straight out, isn't it? You think this is T1, or you think this is T12? Or let's, it's not T12, but let's see how about T11. It's probably more like T11, uh, because we don't see that steep uh, spidus process that would be kind of sticking out of the plane of the page. It's going straight back. Look at how stubby the transverse processes are. The lower you go, the stubbier they, they get. And T12 is just little nubs down here. The spinous process is generally large. T8 is usually the longest. 1 through 4 project just like cervical, straight back. Uh, but... Six, seven, eight. It's by five, five, six, seven, eight. They're the ones that really have that uh, that inferior slope to them, right? Pedicle, lamina, and spinous process would come down like that, right? And then once we get to nine, ten, eleven, twelve, they start to get thicker and fatter, uh, and then they start to project more posteriorly, right? More like that. In fear of uh, the IVFs or neuroforamen, they are again far lateral, uh, like they face laterally. Uh, so you can take an A to P view, or you can take a lateral x ray and you can see the right and left superimposed on one another, just like the lumbar spine. Not true of the cervicals, those are obliquely anterior, which we'll look at. You have to take an oblique view to see them. The IVFs of 1 through 10 are actually associated with ribs, so ribs helps make up the IVFs of 1 through 10. Not true for 11 and 12, but specifically the following structures are associated with the thoracic neuroforamen of 1 through 10. So vertebral body, okay, that's that makes up all intervertebral foramen. Intervertebral disc, that makes up all intervertebral foramen. But the rib head, that is a different tail, right? That, that is only seen in the thoracic spine. And plus, the IVFs, as we said, they're huge compared to spinal nerves. So here, if you want to get technical, I mean, here's this. That's just the superior. That's as big as most IVFs. And that's just the superior vertebral notch there. Um, that's, I'm sorry, the inferior vertebral notch. 
the so here's the fun facts uh, the spinal spinal nerve only occupies about 8% of the volume of the IVF so spinal nerve would look like that in this gigantic thing in the cervical spine it's a tight squeeze only 50% so much tighter squeeze. The lumbar spine, about a third of it is taken up by the IVF. So because of this so much wiggle room, this is one of the main reasons that radiculopathy or radicular pain is so rare in the thoracic spine. What's radiculopathy? Pretty hard to test in the thoracic spine because there's no reflexes, but you can still test sensation with the little pinwheel test or a little pin. Uh, radiculopathy means that you've done a neurological examination and you've found damage. Radicular pain, what would radicular pain look like in the thoracic spine? Hmm. It would be a pain corresponding to the, the dermatones. So it would be a pain wrapping around in a horizontal plane kind of around the lateral chest wall right into the front. So it would it would follow those intercostal nerve patterns. Wouldn't be going down the arm or leg if a problem was in the thoracic spine. Some more fun facts from Kramer. It's the longest region of the spine uh, because why um, or because of its so that's one fun fact because its attachment to ribs Motion segments have very little independent movement, so there's not a lot of thoracic spine movement. You can measure it, um, but it's it's not much movement. The size of the thoracic vertebrae generally increases superior to inferior, okay, to match the increasing axial load. So as you move down, the in other words, T1 is pretty wimpy. It looks like a cervical. T12 is massive. It looks like lumbar spine, so the size of these vertebrae get bigger. The posterior edge of the superior upper thoracic vertebrae have some remnants of uncinate processes, especially T1, so there are uh, a little bit of uncinate process. More fun facts, the left lateral surface of the thoracic vertebrae are more flat compared to the right because the exposure of the pulsating thoracic aorta. So the right side would be a little more concave. The left side is a little flatter. Right, the left is more flat. The right is, or wait, is that right? The left lateral surface, you can tell that this is the second time. Actually, some of these slides are brand new. I'm just kind of still developing this course. I haven't had it that long. Uh, the left lateral surface of the typical thoracic vertebrae are more flat compared to the right because, yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, the lower thoracic vertebrae take on more characteristics of lumbar. Yeah, we said that. A T12 is difficult to tell apart from L1, except what's the huge difference between a T12 and L1? I'm going to actually write that down. I'm gonna, let me look at that pulsating thing. 26. I need to investigate that further. Uh, well, T12 would have a full costal facet for the rib. So L1 wouldn't normally. Uh, the, L, the T3 is the smallest uh, of the in the entire thoracic spine. So that's kind of weird. Actually, T2 and 1 are a little bit bigger. The transverse processes are, also stretch out further. Lateral osteophytes, so bone spurs, are more, are more common on the right side because of the left-located thoracic aorta. So the, the aorta pul is pulsatile, so the pulsating motion against the sides of the vertebrae are going to discourage osteophytes. Therefore, they'll be more common on the right side. Yes, and that matches that too. Okay, uh, spondylosis is very rare in this region because it's supported by or spondylolysis, so fracture, a slip, or one vertebrae. 
Remember we talked about that, if, if it slips in relationship to the vertebrae below. Spinous, so see how it slipped? Grade, probably a grade two spondylo there. Very rare here because you have those stabilizing ribs. Okay, let's talk a little about thoracic spine now more in general. Of course, it's between the cervical and lumbar spine. There's 12 vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae. Spinous processes are very vertical in the middle. We talked about that. The lower and upper regions share some characteristics with their adjacent segments. So upper cervical or upper thoracic resemble the lower cervical and the lower thoracic resemble the upper lumbar in some respects. The curve is kyphotic. We already looked about that because the vertebrae are slightly wedge-shaped. This is not a compensatory curve. This is in vivo. You come right out of the chute with a thoracic curve. You have to because the vertebrae are wedge-shaped. Right there's a real spine there. You can see. You can tell. We can. What region are we in here? It's definitely the mid thoracic spine. Because look at the vertebrae. Right. The really. And the, but see as you get down here low. So five through nine is kind of the Dolly Parton rule. That movie five working five through nine. Right. Because you learned in palpation to palpate, to palpate its transverse process in this region. You have to go up sometimes two interspinous spaces and come out. It's kind of the Dolly Parton rule. Uh, but as you see, the, when we get down to the lower thoracic spine, see how they look more like lumbar vertebrae? They stick straight out like that. Same up here. Uh, they're starting to get a little bit more, uh, more horizontal looking. And we note the kyphotic curve. What about ribs? We got to tell. We'll probably talk more about ribs tomorrow. Well, there's 12 pairs of ribs, usually. Uh, posteriorly, this is confusing too. Or proximally, so the ribs proximal to distal. Proximal is where they connect to the spine. As they move around outward, that's more distally. So where they connect to the sternum is distal. Where they connect to the spine is proximal. Uh, so posteriorly, the thoracic vertebrae are, are, what are we talking about? <laughs> 12 pairs of ribs and posteriorly, or they're posteriorly, they're connected to the thoracic, oh, we'll see that in a second, thoracic vertebrae. Anteriorly, they're connected to the sternum. Do I need to fix that there? Oh yeah, here's the connect right here. Uh, yeah. And we'll also see that anteriorly, they don't really plug right into the sternum. There's an in-between tissue. There's a cartilage called costal cartilage that they connect to. And all 12 connect posterior to, the, to at least one vertebral body. They don't always connect to the transverse process. Remember we said T12 and T11 don't connect to the transverse process. Uh, there are no or there are normally no ribs in the lumbar cervical spine. Although we did look at a cervical rib, didn't we? Okay, now we have this. Make sure you know these parts of the sternum. This is all we're going to say about this. But there's three parts to the sternum. There's this shield-like thing called the manubrium. There is the main body called the body. And then this little delicate tip, which you have to be careful. It ossifies in older people. When you're doing CPR, you don't want to put set up on that, you'll snap that thing off. It can be a source of chronic pain in some people. Um, but that's called the xiphoid process. And that's the smallest, shortest xiphoid process I think I've ever seen. They usually go down further than that. All right, also note, uh, we'll talk about this in fifth quarter, but you need to know the jugular notch is right in the center of the manubrium. And then Kramer uses the term clavicular notch on each side. So that's where the Where's the clavicles plug into the manubrium as well? Okay, then we have facets for the articulation of all these ribs. Kind of weird, rib two is right in between. That's why I used to teach in palpation that if you want to find the T2 ribs to find the second intercostal space, find this 
uprising. This is usually much bigger than this. You can palpate this sternal angle of Louis. If you can find that and slide your fingers off, you've just run right into the second rib. If you drop down into this space, we have two auscultation zones. And this is called the aortic. That's where you listen for the aortic valve. And this is called the pulmonic. That's where you listen for pulmonic valve murmurs. Right? I don't know if they're still teaching that, and I, I don't think they are. But, um, we'll have to go over that fifth quarter. Anyway, yeah, so those are all the parts of that. Only ribs 1 through 7 directly? That's a great question. Only ribs 1 through 7 directly connect to the sternum? Right, so what do you mean by that? Well, really, they're costal cartilage. But there's a connection spot for the costal cartilage of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Seven's a little weird. I'll talk about that in a second. But those are, you know, they connect directly. And therefore, they get the name true rib because they have that true connection. Now, 10 and, or 11 and 12, they don't connect to the front at all. They're called f uh, floating ribs. But there are false ribs. So 8, 9, and 10 uh, are real tr false ribs. 11 and 12 are still can be called false ribs because they don't. A false rib means you don't connect to the sternum at all directly. There's no, there's no facet for you to connect to. But so 11 and 12 are both false ribs, but they get even a different classification because they don't connect to the transverse processes either. There's no transverse costal facet for them. So they're called floating ribs. So I should have put more stars here. This is really important. Got it? Okay, so everything we said in this picture, we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. But look how weird 7 is. So here's 7 coming around like this. And see, it's got somebody joined up with it. We have this bar right here. And if the fifth quarter people know, this is called the costal margin. So this is important. It kind of separates the thoracic cavity uh, from the abdominal cavity. But this costal cartilage is really made up of rib 8, 9, and 10. Rib 11, there's the tip of 11. It doesn't touch anybody. In 12, they float. So those are called floating ribs. So a great question is, who makes up that costal, uh, that costal margin? I got ahead of my slides. So costal margin, uh, ribs 8 through 10 form a single strip. Uh, that's called the costal margin. It separates the abdominal from the thoracic cavity. Costal margins morph into the costal cartilage of T7. Let's see that. See how there's T7's costal cartilage right here? It's too hard to change colors. What would happen if I change colors? Let's see what happens. Uh, how about red? So there's T7 rib. But you see how the blue morphs into it as well. So it kind of mixes in with it. It's still part of the... So 7 is still part of the costal margin, kind of the point there. All right, 1 through 7, we got everything. Yep, we got everything. Okay, costal margin morphs into the costal cartilage of T7, which goes on to connect with the sternum. So the costal margin is made up of the costal cartilage of T7, T8, T9, and T10. How are we good with that? All right. Uh, the facets, let's stop right there. That's We're probably about out of time. That's enough. We'll pick this up tomorrow. So let's see, do we have any more testing? No, we had embryology, so we're done with that. So next week we have spinal anatomy as your next hurdle. We've done the wet lab test. All right, so next week, get ready for spinal anatomy. Some of you didn't do that great on the embryology. 
spinal anatomy is more straightforward, more graspable. Uh, embryology is definitely a tough class. But. All right, see you in the next video.